The following podcast contains advertisements. If you prefer a podcast without advertisements, you can sign up for our ad-free version at patreon.com slash lawfare. That's patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll get rid of the ads and we'll be very grateful. People who value sleep sleep on a nectar mattress, but you're not going to believe me. After all, I might be lying. I must be lying. The only thing you know is true is that commercials lie to you. I must be lying. Instead of believing silly commercials, trust the more than 2 million happy sleepers who sleep on a Nectar mattress. Nectar Sleep is currently running their biggest offer ever. $399 in accessories plus a 365-night home trial and free shipping and returns. Go to Nectarsleep.com today. I'm Emily Day, and this is an episode from the Lawfare Archives for October 3rd, 2021. There's been a lot of focus on North Korea this week, with the country one day raising hopes for diplomatic relations with South Korea and the next firing missiles to show off their warfighting capabilities. So for this week, I chose a conversation from August 5th, 2017, between Benjamin Wittes, Mia Rapp Hooper, an adjunct senior fellow at the Center for a New American Security, and Steph Haggard, a distinguished professor of political science at the University of California, San Diego, discussing diplomatic and military options for addressing the North Korean threat. I'm Matthew Kahn, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, August 5th, 2017. Kim Jong-un's fast-growing nuclear capability has captured the world's attention. This week, Benjamin Wittes sat down with Mira Rapp Hooper, adjunct senior fellow at the Center for a New American Security, and Steph Haggard, distinguished professor of political science at UC San Diego, to discuss their takes on the recent developments on the Korean Peninsula. The conversation covered North Korea's recent spree of missile tests, the stability of deterrence against the Kim regime, whether economic sanctions still have a chance to make a difference, and how the new U.S. president affects the geopolitical dynamics in East Asia. It's the Lawfare Podcast, Episode 241, Mira Rapp Hooper and Steph Haggard on North Korea. Mira, get us started Um, with this latest spree of North Korean missile tests. What can we say about where they are? So the spree of North Korean missile tests that has been proceeding for the last many months uh, kind of took on a new form in the month of July. Uh, Perfectly timed, of course, on our Independence Day, North Korea tested what we now know to be its first ICBM. Um, And estimates of analysts who watch North Korea and its nuclear and missile arsenals closely was that this missile test conducted on the 4th of July probably meant that when the ICBM became operational, North Korea now had the ability to hit Alaska and perhaps the west coast of the United States. Just three weeks later, they tested again uh, another ICBM on July 28th. And this test was actually a bit different. Uh, This test lasted for a longer time. And as a result, analysts were able to determine that if the ICBM was carrying a light enough warhead, North Korea may now have the ability to range the middle of the country, like let's say Chicago, and perhaps even the east coast of the United States. There were a few things about these two tests that made them distinct. Uh, The first one was a daytime test. The second one was at night, um, which meant that the North Koreans were testing operational conditions for this missile. In the second test, their reentry vehicle looks like it may have failed. But the big takeaway is that these two tests coming very close together um, and the fact that North Korea made changes between the two of them is that North Korea is moving rapidly towards an operational ICBM capability with the ability to hit the United States of America. Steph, how do you read it? Is that is there reason to be uh, more optimistic than that about about what these tests means, more pessimistic or is or do you think uh, Mira's account is is a, is is about right. No, I think Mira's account is broadly correct. I would just add some footnotes. Uh, first of all, the acceleration in the number and pace of testing 
uh, has actually been going on for almost the entire Kim Jong-un era. So I, I think this has been an incremental development, but we're talking about a five-year span now that looks quite different from the period of missile testing under his father. So this is clearly something which is also an initiative I think we need to associate with this uh, particular regime. The sources of uncertainty have to do not with the missile program so much, which we can track, but with the whole question of miniaturization of a nuclear device, because we don't now know if the North Koreans have what we would call a weapon, which is something that can be put on a delivery system. We've seen Kim Jong-un with a mock-up um, of something that looks like it's a plausible weapon design, but a re-entry is tough with a warhead because the warhead has to uh, survive the turbulence of not only launch and flight, but of course re-entry. And I think right now that's probably where the largest uncertainties are. No disagreement from me on any of those points. So, Steph, when you look at the aggregate situation, how long do you think we have before North Korea is meaningfully capable of hitting anywhere it wants in the United States reliably with a nuclear warhead? Well, first, uh, let me make one more additional footnote, and that is that the extension of these capabilities already poses risks to the United States because they're able to target uh, American forces in the Asia Pacific. So hitting the homeland has an obvious political optic associated with it. But from a strategic point of view, the questions about extended deterrence and the risks of extended deterrence, which we can talk about, are already there as long as North Korea is capable of hitting Japan or Guam. And yet, if you're a resident of Chicago, sure, I, I do think there is a difference between, uh, between theater deterrence and, with all due respect to my friends who live in Guam, uh, there's a difference uh, between the ability to hit Guam and the ability to hit Chicago. No, that's clearly true, you know, because it adds an additional layer of caution. But I'm just saying that the dilemmas of extended deterrence, that is the question of whether in a crisis the U.S. has the same options to escalate, those are already put in some uh, jeopardy as a result of the capacity to strike forces within the region as well. Right. So, but presumably, if you're trying to establish a nuclear deterrence, you want to be able to hit anything you might want to hit. How long do you think we are from that point where, where the North Koreans really have the ability to strike at will wherever they want to hit? I think what, from what we've seen in the missile program in terms of the capacity to throw resources at a problem and solve it, I don't think anyone thinks this is more than two years away at the outside. I, I, the main thing that the missile program has demonstrated is that the regime is willing to throw a lot of resources at these problems, and I don't see any reason why mounting, you know, miniaturizing is going to be any different from those other problems that they've solved. What do you think, Mira? Is are we talking two years at the outside, or is there some reason to think it might be a more protracted exercise than that? I certainly agree that we're looking at two years at the outside. It obviously could be sooner than that if, as Steph signaled, they throw a ton of resources behind this problem. Part of the reason we have trouble uh, knowing exactly how far away they are from miniaturization, uh, just to belabor the point for a second, is that of course when North Korea tests nuclear devices, it does so underground. So while we can measure um, approximate kilotonnage on the basis of the Richter scale and other metrics, we don't actually know how big the device is that they're testing. And it really matters. 
um, that they'd be able to create a relatively lightweight device if they're gonna try to mount it atop an ICBM and deliver, a bit, deliver it effectively as Steph signaled. Um, so this is not a small task, um, but this is certainly within their ability to accomplish in some number of months. And I agree it's probably less than 24. Um, the other thing I'll note is that if there was something to sort of throw them off the trail, and I don't know that it would do this, at this point, the only way I think we can really think about um, intervening in this trajectory is if there were to be some form of diplomacy that at least pause their progress. And we can get into the nitty gritty of whether or not that has any chance of working, which it very well may not. Um, but insofar as we are able to tinker with that timeline, that's what we're talking about by and large. Okay, so before we get to diplomacy as an option, there are two uh, defensive military options that have been, you know, much discussed. Uh, one is uh, missile defense, and the other, thanks to David Sanger of the New York Times, is cyber attacks. And I'm interested for both of your sense of of how uh, how plausible these are as a means of countering this program. Uh, I'm happy to tee off just briefly. Um, I'll, I'll start with missile defense and note that when you talk about the efficacy of U.S. missile defense, it's really critical to break it into two different categories, at least in my mind. Uh, the first category are you know, what we might call theater missile defenses or um, missile defenses that are forward deployed in East Asia, uh, now in South Korea and Japan, that are designed to intercept short and medium, uh, sometimes intermediate range ballistic missiles in their boost phase, meaning uh, right after they take off. Uh, those have a pretty highly proven success rate uh, in testing environments, and we can be reasonably confident um, in those missile defense uh, efficacies. The other type of missile defense, and the type that we're really talking about when we talk about a North Korean ICBM, is the ground-based mid-course defense system, which is deployed in Alaska um, here in the United States. Uh, and theoretically has the ability to intercept an incoming ICBM in the terminal phase of flight, that is before it hits the United States. This missile defense system does not have a good test record. It has been under development for a very long time. Um, the first deployment was authorized during the Clinton administration, and its efficacy just sort of ekes up from there. Um, so when we talk about missile defense, um, I do think it's important to separate the two because we have one type already in the theater, um, which is, we believe, uh, reasonably effective for a particular type of missile. Um, and we have another kind, the kind that is intended to protect the homeland that is much less reliable than that. On cyber, um, certainly David Sanger is the expert as you signal. My understanding is that uh, cyber interference has the potential ability to delay uh, the missile program, uh, e even at its most successful, but it is highly unlikely to in any way permanently throw the North Koreans off their course. It will create problems that they will eventually figure out how to handle. What do you think, Steph? Yeah, I agree that these, uh, you know, these new technologies, I think, are still in their infancy. I, I think the missile community was not as impressed with the Sanger piece in the Times as, as some others have been um, in terms of how far along it is. But there are some other technologies on the horizon, you know, for example, the use of drones to um, to put up another layer of defense that would actually go after missiles in the boost phase, even if they're intercontinental. So I think there's going to be some evolution on the defensive side as well, um, just as a result of, of what we've seen coming from the North Koreans. Okay, but we are... So what I hear you guys saying is there may be some promise in certain areas with missile defense, um, uh, and there may be further developments that improve defense, but for some period of time, we are living with the prospect of a North Korea that is capable of reaching a lot of targets, uh, a lot of targets now and uh, at the outside edge two years from now, anywhere it wants within the continental United States. Uh, against that environment, we have Kim Jong-un, uh, uh, who is, uh, you know, certainly not a nice guy, 
and we've got a, a, a relatively unstable leadership of our own. So, Steph, give us a sense of like how you game out what uh, what the strategic problem looks like now uh, for uh, the United States, uh, given that we are facing this problem with a young leader we don't understand and a leader of our own whom we don't understand. Yeah, so I, I think it's very important to get you know to the to what the real strategic problem is, and let me say that I'm uh, probably in a minority that thinks that the Korean Peninsula is fundamentally stable, um, and I think it's fundamentally stable because it's not only the defensive capabilities that matter; it's the deterrent capabilities that matter, and no one believes that if we did get into a crisis and had to escalate that there wasn't a good likelihood that we could prevail in such a setting. So the North Koreans also have to take into account our deterrent capabilities as well as our defensive capabilities. But I think the strategic worries center on two things. One is we don't know much about North Korean nuclear doctrine. And uh, the Kim Jong-un himself personally has used the word preemption and whenever you have a party, and particularly two parties, talking about preemption, then the risk of crisis instability obviously escalates, because if he thinks we're coming, even if we're not, then it changes his incentives to act. The second problem is that uh, is the so-called stability-instability paradox, which is that if the central strategic balance between the two countries is stable, then Kim Jong-un might believe that he's able to get away with more at lower levels and that he could, for example, probe along the northern limit line or he could in, engage in more aggressive cyber actions or he could even do something conventional along the DMZ and the U.S. and Korea would essentially be deterred from responding in an aggressive way. That would almost certainly be a miscalculation after the events of 2010 on the peninsula, the sinking of the Chonan and the shelling of Yongpyong Island. But it's miscalculation exactly that I think is the strategic risk at this point, not a bolt from the blue or Kim Jong-un using um, weapons of mass destruction explicitly as a, as a, a weapon of blackmail. Mira, what do you think? Is the situation fundamentally stable? Do you agree with that premise? Uh, I agree with the premise, certainly, uh, that deterrence uh, is pretty stable. And I would, I would note the point um, which Steph gestured at, which is that actually deterrence as a phenomenon as a, and as a construct for thinking about the situation on the Korean Peninsula is not at all new and did not emerge in 2006 when North Korea first developed a nuclear weapon and tested it. The divided situation on the Korean Peninsula is, of course, a stalemated war um, in which conventional deterrence has prevailed since 1953. The United States and its ally in South Korea has largely been have largely been operating through a deterrence construct when thinking about their strategy for handling North Korea since the Korean War ended, and it has taken on a very new dimension with North Korea's nuclear and missile capabilities that puts more of the region and the world in play. Uh, but it is not the case that this is the first time we are thinking about how to deter North Korea. We're actually pretty good at that. Um, and I do believe in the stability of nuclear deterrence in large part because I think uh, I share the views with, with much of the nuclear community that Kim Jong-un has pursued nuclear weapons with a special vigor uh, because he's hoping to ensure his own survival. Um, and what that means is that he is unlikely to use nuclear weapons first, knowing, as Steph signaled, that the United States would eventually prevail in any type of serious exchange, whether conventional or nuclear. Um, but the contingency in which he might use nuclear weapons would be one in which he feels that the regime and his fate is directly threatened. So barring that contingency in which there is a direct threat to the survival of the Kim regime, I do think deterrence on the Korean Peninsula is pretty stable. In, in which case, we have to ask, how big a change is it for him to be meaningfully nuclearly capable as he 
now is with respect to you know ICBMs and 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 long distance missiles. If if the deterrence was stable before and it's stable now, what's changed except in theory? Well, it, I, you know, just to go back to the two uh, problems that I mentioned before, you know, if for some reason the U.S. leadership uh, decides that this is an intolerable problem, perhaps politically, and starts talking about the necessity of preempting or undertaking preventive war because the window is short before we know that they have a capability, then that increases the risks, even if slight, of crisis instability. Uh, so, you know, it, and this is one area where I think the president's tweets or comments that are not thought through do carry some risk. I mean, particularly if the U.S. is mo moving military assets in such a way that Kim Jong-un perceives that he may be, you know, under serious threat. But, you know, the second problem is the one I alluded to of him feeling that this gives him uh, latitude to do other things and, you know, to probe with respect to the South, to, to undertake a variety of lower level or different types of, uh, you know, actions in different types of domains that then become, um, you know, difficult for the United States and South Korea to live with. Uh, so, for example, if there were a conventional challenge along the Northern Limit Line or along the DMZ, it's pretty clear to me that South Korea and the United States have, have decided that they will have to act more decisively than they did in 2010. But he might not think that we're capable of doing that because he sits on a nuclear weapon. So it's those kinds of risks. I don't want to minimize them. I still believe in my claim that the peninsula is, is fundamentally stable, but the risks have increased marginally of those types of calculations around preemption and around the stability and stability paradox. I would love to add one more complication to the pile here, and I do think it's a significant one, although we might call it primary, primarily political, as Steph suggested earlier, and that is that I think the development of the ICBM does pose a major challenge to the way the United States manages its alliances, in particular with South Korea and Japan. In the development of uh, its capability to hit the United States, North Korea has reintroduced into the mix a problem that the United States of America dealt with throughout the Cold War with its NATO allies, and that was the problem or fear of decoupling. Now, what that means um, for those who are not completely indoctrinated in, in Cold War strategy is because the adversary can hold at risk the U.S. homeland, the United States may be less inclined to intervene using nuclear weapons or even conventional weapons on behalf of its allies should it come to that because they know that the adversary can hit them back in a devastating manner. This, as I suggested, was a huge problem in NATO when the Soviet Union developed ICBM capabilities in the 1960s, and NATO spent most of the 1960s figuring out how to come to some kind of modus vivendi to calm the nerves of our European allies who had become convinced that we might not intervene in a war on their behalf. With the development of this ICBM, Kim Jong-un has essentially created the same problem with South Korea and Japan, uh, who will become more angsty that U.S. security guarantees are not credible and that the United States might not be there to defend them. U.S. security guarantees in this region have been an important uh, insurance policy that have meant that neither South Korea or Japan has gone too seriously down the path of pursuing nuclear weapons of their own, although both have actually thought about it at various times. So it, in this environment, becomes incredibly important that the United States do serious both diplomacy um, and undertake cooperative defense efforts with both of those allies and ideally moving farther down the road of trilateral cooperation amongst the United States, South Korea, and Japan to try to minimize uh, those fears of decoupling and keep those alliances intact to avert South Korea and Japan's development of independent capabilities that could add some more instability to the picture. Yeah, I mean, okay, so. uh, Ben, you get, you've got two people who are maybe too much on the same page. I mean, I completely agree with what Mira said about the decoupling issue and just want to point to some recent developments that demonstrate it. Uh, Moon Jae-in came in running on a pro-engagement platform, and look how in the last week he's already moved back towards 
allowing the THAAD deployment, the, the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense System, a BMD system, to be deployed in Korea. He's talking about the nuclear weapons problem as the primary problem. He's given up the idea that he would be in the driver's seat on this. In other words, he's very much concerned to make sure that the alliance is being bolstered as a result of the of these new developments. And I think that that is a direct reflection of of the of the point that's been made about decoupling. Hey, everyone, it's Jen and Jess from the beauty podcast, Fat Mascara. We're excited to tell you about Strivectin's Advanced Retinol Nightly Renewal Moisturizer, which gives you all the benefits of retinol without irritation. That's right. After four weeks of use, testers saw visible improvement in fine lines, wrinkles, texture, and radiance, and 0% reported irritation. Plus, Strivectin's Advanced Retinol Nightly Renewal Moisturizer has Nia 114, Strivectin's patented form of niacin that's clinically shown to enhance the efficacy of retinol while limiting common sensitivity. Visit Strivectin.com to learn more. People who value sleep, sleep on a nectar mattress. But you're not going to believe me. After all, I might be lying. I must be lying. The only thing you know is true is that commercials lie to you. I must be lying. Instead of believing silly commercials, trust the more than 2 million happy sleepers who sleep on a nectar mattress. Nectar Sleep is currently running their biggest offer ever, $399 in accessories plus a 365-night home trial and free shipping and returns. Go to Nectarsleep.com today. Okay, so let's talk about diplomacy uh, in an environment in which the situation is fundamentally stable as as a deterrent matter, uh, but there's a dangerous uh, risk of misunderstanding. It seems like a good environment potentially for diplomacy, except that nobody seems to regard the current environment as a good one for diplomacy. Uh, So the question, Mira, you alluded to this before, what are the prospects here for talks to deliver what, if anything? So, you know, the United States has obviously been through interminable rounds of uh, diplomacy with North Korea over its nuclear weapons program, and none of them have ended well. There certainly have been mistakes on the United States side, uh, things we could have done much better. But especially recently, and especially under Kim Jong-un, North Korea has given no indication that it is thinking in any way seriously about giving up nuclear weapons or long-range missiles anytime soon. Um, In fact, I think many people who watch this issue think that in addition to buying himself an insurance policy to help his regime survive, Kim Jong-un would eventually like to be sort of de facto accepted as a nuclear power who must be dealt with on those terms. Um, And we can debate whether or not that's true, but the point is simply that I don't think we have a lot of reason to believe that renewed diplomacy would bring us a Kim this time around who's really eager to give up his increased increasingly bristling arsenal. That said, um, there are interim goals that the United States could certainly think of that fall far short of a fully denuclearized Korean peninsula or, uh, you know, removing the ICBM capability, such as agreements to limit uh, the nuclear program in a number of ways. It is possible that some form of re-engagement could move us a little bit down that path. Um, And certainly there are many in the nuclear community who at this point would favor that. Uh, I would just note that when it comes to placing major limits on or succeeding in reducing the dangers of other countries' nuclear arsenals, ultimately this almost always happens through some form of diplomacy. Usually it has to be the nuclear power itself who is going to consent to give up its arsenal or agree to limits on its program. Um, So this is the reason why there is still some glimmer of hope that diplomacy might eventually produce something um, that's at least directionally good. Although I think uh, most of us who watch this issue, issue closely think there's absolutely no hope at present time that Kim's giving up the good stuff. What do you think, Steph? Is there any prospect of any imaginable negotiation leading anywhere conceivably useful? 
Well, first, uh, let me agree with a couple of things and then map out where the thinking is currently both outside the administration and in it about how we might move forward. So first, I think everyone thinks that abandonment of nuclear weapons is a low probability event. And the uh, the target or the objective in the short run, I think, has fundamentally been shifted from denuclearization to simply getting back to talks at all. And that's really what the, the diplomacy now is about. Uh, number two, though, um, the one issue that hasn't been brought up so far, which is absolutely crucial to all this, is the question of inducements and sanctions. Because if Kim Jong-un is basically satisfied with where he is, then there's no there's no reason to come back to talks. And the only way to change his thinking in that regard is either to offer him some inducement that would make him still better off or to assure that he pays some cost, which would make him rethink the value of the program. Inducements generally appear to have been of declining interest. Obviously, the regime would like to see sanctions lifted, but we don't hear the North Koreans, for example, talking about security assurances in the way that they they have in the past. So what that means is we're basically back in a world which was first navigated by Bill Perry back in 1998 of essentially coercive diplomacy, where the administration has got to send two messages simultaneously. One, that we're open to talking, um, as long as those talks at least include the issue of denuclearization. We can't sit down and talk uh, without addressing our own interests. Um, but simultaneously, there has been an effort, which I think is becoming more innovative over time, to think seriously about how to uh, place sanctions on North Korea. And obviously, since the United States doesn't trade uh, virtually at all or at all with North Korea, this is going to have to be done through its dominant trading par partner, which, uh, which is the Chinese. And so uh, the new sanctions legislation, which has just been passed, obviously most of the focus was on Russia and Iran, folded in a House uh, piece of legislation that provides a substantially wider array of instruments to the president, and some of those mandatory actually, to go after firms that are trading with North Korea in ways that are significant. And so uh, those, those sanctions are going to drop. Uh, and the president even has the power to go after entities which are like Chinese oil companies that are engaged in trade with North Korea. So the next phase of this is going to be an escalation of sanctions on the United States. But if you saw uh, Secretary Tillerson's very interesting comments yesterday, day before yesterday at the State Department, it's clear that, you know, he's he's saying that regime change is not an objective of the United States. Collapse is not an objective. We're not interested in sending troops north of the 38th parallel. That's obviously to assure the Chinese. We're not interested in unification. We're interested in negotiations, but they have to be about denuclearization. And in the interim, we're going to protect ourselves through sanctions, which are both defensive and strategic in seeking to move the Kim Jong-un regime back to the table. I'll let Mira jump in, but um, I can talk about how I think a financial crisis could evolve in, in North Korea. It's not impossible that these sanctions could work. I think they've been underestimated. Uh, the problem is they haven't been tried. Okay, so let's get to that in a moment. But um, Mira, the last time you were on the podcast, uh, you were harshly critical of the Trump administration's uh, approach, which at the time seemed to be to sort of give up everything else in Asia to the Chinese in the hope that the Chinese would uh, do something about North Korea. And you rather presciently predicted that the consequences of this might be that we have no phone ops and the Chinese don't do anything about North Korea. In recent, in recent weeks, uh, the president has been tweeting frustration along the lines that you described. And so I'm interested, I mean, you can, first of all, take a victory lap and say, I told you so. But, um, but I, give us a sense of what where the administration has been and where you understand it to be now with respect to kind of getting China to tighten the leash on, on North Korea? 
Well, I only gave myself a very short victory lap, so I'm back already. Um, And I will say that I think it's sort of been interesting to watch uh, this change of heart in the president, if you will. It seemed like in uh, late June, early July, he might be preparing for an actual volt fuss on the China question um, when it came to North Korea. He, uh, you know, not only did they announce new sanctions, uh, but announced the first uh, Taiwan arms sales package. There were two freedom of navigation operations very close together. There were a couple of other steps that the administration took, all of which seemed to signal that it was really running short on patience with the Chinese. Um, After that, however, the president sort of continued to, in the public square, heap praise on Xi Jinping and China in a couple of subsequent interviews, and it didn't actually seem like uh, the momentum carried through on that desire to get tough with China. Um, But of course, um, as Steph mentioned and described extraordinarily well, we now have this new package of sanctions that's just come through Congress, and the president has continued to signal via Twitter and elsewhere that he's extremely displeased with the Chinese. Um, And we've heard that there may be new economic measures against China coming soon. So basically what it has seemed to me like throughout this summer is kind of a slow playing of this perspective volt fuss against China. Basically, the president has internalized the fact that Xi Jinping is not going to be his savior on the North Korea question, as most of us realized he would not be. Um, But he's still uh, relatively hesitant as to how much he wants to do about that. And that may be in large part attributable to the fact that there are really at least two schools of thought within the administration when it comes to how to handle China. But I'll let stuff jump in here. OK, so, so b- before we before we get to, to Steph's uh, uh, idea of precipitating a financial crisis using sanctions, I just want to tick through where we've been so far. We've said they're they're basically there. Uh, that is, uh, you know, missile capable anywhere they want to be. Uh, uh, we have no good defensive options as of yet. We have no good offensive options as of yet. Um, uh, d- we have no realistic prospects for diplomacy. And the big initiative of giving up everything to the Chinese so that they would deal with the problem is a flop. And the one thing we have left on the table that either of you has given a ray of hope about is sanctions. So with all the eggs in the sanctions basket, Steph, what's the uh, what's the case that we can actually make this work? Uh, Well, the case is is fairly simple, actually. It's that somewhere between 85 and 95 percent of North Korea's trade is with the Chinese. Um, and we pretty much know the firms that are engaged in this business, in part from outstanding open source research that's been conducted by a number of think tanks in Washington and elsewhere. Uh, the number of importers from North Korea, that is, uh, Chinese firms that are importing from North Korea, has fallen steadily, uh, partly because of business as well as political risks. Um, We've taken out some pretty important players um, through exposure that's been brought to bear again by open source reporting. Uh, The Chinese closed down the Hongshan Group uh, late last year over violations of of coal sanctions and and corruption primarily. And I think we know uh, which firms are engaged in this trade. And the way that secondary sanctions work is that the larger Chinese groups Uh, need access to the American financial market and particularly its clearing system. And so going after these firms means that they're going to have to make a calculation about whether their North Korea business is worth um, pursuing in light of being cut off from the American financial market. And these were authorities that President Obama had Uh, after February 2016, legislation passed at that time. But he was extremely cautious in using them. And I think that Trump's hands are actually now tied on North Korea as well as Russia, because some portions of the new sanctions legislation actually calls for mandatory secondary sanctions against entities that are involved in certain bits of 
of trade, and they certainly provide the discretion to go after pretty much anyone. So, um, you know, I think that this is a strategy which has been lying around. It's been pursued uh, on paper at some great length, and it just really hasn't been tried. Uh, you know, the new data on North Korea-China trade was released by a South Korean association, COTRA, about two or three days ago. It showed a 6% increase in both imports and exports over 2016 uh, compared to 2015. So it's clear that what the Chinese are doing is they're agreeing to very narrow multilateral sanctions and things like the coal ban, but then they're turning around and simultaneously providing the regime with exports and continuing to import and provide them foreign exchange and allowing them to run a large current account deficit, which is basically financed somehow. So I think that what the South Koreans, United States and Japan have said for some time is, enough with this charade. We don't care what products you sanction. We don't care about the narrow details of how the sanctions are written. We want to move into a world where whatever sanctions are being undertaken are actually having material effect. We're seeing a decline in trade between China and North Korea. And that metric is just easy to watch. And so, uh, you know, I think the pressure is going to be on China to do something this time around. Okay, so Mira, uh, let's let's wrap this up. Presumably, the reason the Obama administration was reticent about uh, uh, using uh, a heavy-handed san secondary sanctions regime against Chinese companies is that they're afraid of damaging U.S.-Chinese relations and specifically of starting some kind of retaliatory trade war cycle. Uh, how big a risk is that, and and how protective do you expect the Chinese to be of the North of, of their company's ability to do business with North Korea? Um, I, I would actually back up from there and say I certainly think direct retaliation in the economic sphere was one of the concerns of the Obama administration, but that the Obama administration's concern on this topic was actually broader than that. There was a bit of a tendency, I think, um, in the last administration to sort of trade issues um, or, or think of the administration as needing to trade issues with the Chinese. So meaning if you were really trying to get over the line on the climate change agreement, for example, um, folks in the administration perceived it to be the wrong time to get really tough on Chinese banks. So they were worried about blowback in other policy areas that was certainly broader than just the narrow uh, economic picture. That said, there's certainly a, a reason to be concerned that the Chinese might retaliate. Um, one could think of them taking all manner of relatively lower level actions, which would still have significant consequences, such as making it much harder for American businesses to operate in China. That's kind of low hanging fruit. Um, but, you know, around the time when uh, Trump as a candidate started talking a big game about a trade war with China, um, there were a lot of calculations done by analysts at Moody's and elsewhere uh, that examined the dynamics that could lead to a trade war between the United States and China. And if that were to occur, you know, this could plunge the world into a recession. So there's no question that taken to an extreme, a retaliatory economic dynamic between the United States and China could have terrible effects indeed. But it is also possible that the Chinese would see fit to retaliate in a much more narrow way that is sort of more appropriate to the sanctions at hand. It, of course, goes without saying uh, that China is sort of reputationally on the hook when the United States levels these sanctions against Chinese entities. Of course, when we impose secondary sanctions, we're imposing them against specific banks um, and companies, not the Chinese government itself. Uh, but it is a direct indictment of the regime's failure to crack down on North Korea when we do so. Uh, so one might think that that's something of a mitigant on China's desire to uh, sort of lash out in the economic sphere, because of course it is implicit finger pointing at the regime's failure to do more than very nominally comply with the multilateral sanctions that Steph mentioned. Okay, so one last question, and then I'll let you both go. 
How significant a factor is it in the way this is playing out that the president of the United States today is Donald Trump and not Barack Obama and not Hillary Clinton? Is this, you know, uh, a, a, a sort of icing uh, on on the cake or is this a significant feature of the environment uh, that, you know, that that is important to the underlying dynamics? Well, I, believe it or not, I think there are pros and cons, frankly. I mean, the obvious cons are that, that you know, this public diplomacy vis-a-vis uh, Xi Jinping personally, as well as China, is just obviously counterproductive. I mean, the concept of face is a virtual cliche with respect to Asian politics and culture. But, you know, to simply go after China in this highly visible way and personally after Xi Jinping and to blame him and so forth is just clearly a minus. I mean, it's embarrassing a guy who sees himself as a quite powerful figure and an equal of Trump's. Um, so all of that is is a negative. And I think some of this diplomacy could be managed in a much more low-key way where the U.S. is presenting the financial forensic evidence on particular firms, particularly those that are actually violating U.N. sanctions, and let the Chinese handle this. That's what they did in the case of Hongshong. So dragging this into the public, as Trump is inclined to do, is certainly not helpful. But on the other hand, frankly, I just don't see the president very engaged in the substance of this or any other policy issue. And what that means is that the people who are formulating these options that Tillerson and Susan Thornton and others have been talking about in the public domain, it means that they have some discretion to pursue this line of thinking and to at least see if it works. And I think it's quite possible that if Tillerson is able to pursue the type of things he's doing, will at least have greater clarity about where the the picture stands over the next several months. The sanctions are not going to bite immediately. There's going to be some time involved. But, um, you know, there's an option to pursue this diplomacy precisely because the president is not adequately on top of the details that he could uh, mess with it. So, uh, you know, I'm not hopeful, but I, I don't think that the path forward is impossible. Mira, finish us up. Is uh, pros and cons associated with Trump's disengagement here, or is it, uh, or, or or is it uh, more more con than pro? I very much appreciate Steph's analysis. I think he just uh, pushed on a bunch of good points. I tend to lean much more con than pro on this one. Uh, predominantly because of how I weight my concerns about the North Korea situation. And my biggest concern uh, is simply irresponsible and promiscuous signaling that regime change may be in the offing. Uh, Because to my mind, that is the most dangerous situation we could possibly signal when it comes to this leader and the capabilities that he's trying to develop. We have seen in the last couple of weeks um, the director of the CIA in a public speech uh, signal that that the United States intended to, quote, separate Kim Jong-un from his nuclear program, which uh, implied regime change. We've had other major officials in the administration say that that was possible. And then we had Secretary Tillerson rightly say that the United States did not intend to pursue regime change. But to my mind, um, this is not just an issue of sort of having muddled signaling on a policy question, as I think we would say the Trump administration does on most foreign policy issues. This is an incoherence on the heart of the matter which is why Kim Jong-un wants nuclear weapons in the first place. Um, So to my mind, this is a unique administration and one that really needs to pull it together on this key question. If it is to be able to put in place these rigorous sanctions that take time to bite and pursue the diplomacy that those in the State Department might be thinking about right now. Mira, Steph, thank you very much for joining us. I have a feeling we'll have the opportunity to do it again. I I look forward to it. (laughs) I think we can bet on it. Thanks, Ben. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You should follow the Lawfare Podcast on Twitter, tweet the podcast, share it on Facebook, and give us a rating on iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever podcast distribution system you use. Our music is performed by Sophia Dian. As always, thanks for listening. 
What's new in podcasting? Here's what we love, courtesy of Acast Recommends. I'm Andrew Marchand, and he's John Oran, and we're starting a sports media podcast. John, why are we doing this? Because nobody breaks more sports media news than you do, Andrew. And in this pod, I'm going to be able to find out exactly who your sources are. Now, that's not going to happen. But really, what's the deal? This is about taking listeners inside the offices and telling them all about the personalities and deals in sports media. Listen to the Marshan and Oran Sports Media Podcast every Wednesday from the New York Post and Sports Business Journal and subscribe. ACAST, A-cast. 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 A-cast.